Good morning and welcome to the RBG Holdings PLC interim results presentation for the period of 30th of June 2022. Throughout this recorded presentation, investors are being in listen only mode. Questions are encouraged and can be submitted at any time via the Q&A tab situated in the right hand corner of your screen. Just click Q&A, scroll to the bottom, type your question and press send. The company may not be in a position to answer every question received during the meeting itself. However, the company review all questions submitted today and publish responses where it's appropriate to do so. Before we begin, we'd like to submit the following poll. I'd now like to hand you over to Nicola Falston, CEO, and Robert Parker, CFO. Good morning. Thank you very much, Paul, and good morning. And um, I'm imagining that we've got quite a few um, existing investors um, on with us today. But just in case we have a couple of uh, new ones, just to remind you that I'm um, the group CEO. I took over in 2016, bringing the um, business to market in 2018 um, on a buy and build platform for professional services and to invest in litigation finance as the, as the icing on the cake. My background is um, Brands Hatch, where I acquired it in oh, after 1991, I think, that long ago, and uh, took it to market. And then so later it was acquired by Interpublic and American uh, PLC and returning investors six, seven times um, post tax on money. Um, and I'm joined today by Robert, who will just introduce himself quickly. Um, hi, morning everyone. I'm Robert Parker. I've spent the last 30 odd years, because I'm very old, in senior finance positions across multiple sectors and across different ownership structures. So I've been a listed CFO three times. I've worked in telecoms, software, digital media, um, fuels, and over the last three or four years in professional services. Super, thanks Robert. And then just turning to remind everyone um, about our structure and what we look like. Um, for those of you that are regulars with us, you'll notice that a little blob is missing on the right hand side called Abnitor. We felt that that was distracting everyone a little bit. It was a very, very, very small, I mean, sub £100,000 um, investment. And it was really just about making our IT platform um, cost effective. In my experience, and I've been in quite a few industries and Robert and even more, Legal services do pay an inordinate amount of money for IT, and therefore we were quite um, keen to have a very cost-effective, cost-plus platform. We've just translated that into a debt arrangement, but we retain the same cost-plus agreement with um, Abnitor, and they continue to, to make sure that our IT comes in um, as close to cost um, as possible. Um, I'll talk a little bit about why we haven't done any M&A um, to date, uh, when I come to that um, part of the presentation a bit later. So we always state where our strategy was. We came to the market on the basis that as a commercial management team uh, with no legal management on the main board, we were best placed to take the cherry pick the best of what is in the industry to grow the legal business, um, buying quality high margin businesses um, and adding selective M&A to that and using our expertise because we were predominantly a litigation um, house to start with, using that expertise to pick investments initially on our own balance sheet, on cases that we run for our clients, and then latterly through our third party litigation funding division, Lionfish. Um, how are we progressing against that strategy? Um, well, today we're going to uh, announce a good set of half year results, which has seen us move our numbers uh, materially since we came to market. We now close the summer uh, with around 200 staff and uh, 130 firms across the business. So um, we are growing um, in line with um, our strategy and in terms of what we said we would do, um, um, but there is still much more to be done. Um, in terms of our litigation investments, and I'll let uh, Robert bring out the numbers in his presentation, um, but obviously we have two types of investments, um, those that are our own client matters and those run by third party litigation uh, funders. It's important to uh, remember that Lionfish came was a startup in May 2020. Um, it was always anticipated that it would do late stage investments in smaller um, by, by va value, smaller quantum claims um, it, as a um, natural mix with the business that we run internally for the elephantine cases that Rosenblatt carries on its books. Um, by the nature of that investment cycle, we wouldn't expect to see settlements or results from court until the latter half of 2022 and early 2023. And this year is the first year that we don't actively market litigation investment sales to third party investors, although you will see from our results that we did have some in, in H1. Um, and the reason for that, as I stated at our results presentation in 21, is because you haven't just turned off the tap. There is a natural flow of interest that we're still just servicing um, at the moment. In terms of our M&A strategy, we have um, 
a stated aim of only looking at high quality, um, high margin, generally not buying things that are low um, margin, high volume, um, generally not looking at high street, re high street retail, but looking at services that add value to that we've already done. In having Rosen Latin Memory Crystal, we've now created a solid base of a professional service, of a legal services business, which is full service. So now we're only looking at those aspects in legal services that we don't currently service. Um, and those, um, and we do have a steady pipeline of M&A, but for M&A to be successful, you need um, a marriage of certain circumstances. You need to get the price right with the M&A, you need um, your debt structure to be correct, and you need the price at which you, and how you're um, financing that through consideration or issue of equity paper to be right. Um, and at the moment, not all of those are coming, are lining up um, correctly, and um, it's very difficult to execute M&A uh, when we're trading below our IPO issue price. We always take a quick look at our track record in terms of um, profitability. And I know there'll be a question later, as I've seen it, about how we um, have performed since IPO. And I think it's important to remember when we look at this slide, we don't state 2018, but our year of IPO, we delivered 12 million revenue and 4.3 million EBITDA, 34% group margin. And we closed the year at 93 pence, having issued shares at 95 pence. Um, so the only thing that isn't tracking with this graph um, is our share price. And it's the only thing over which I have no control. Um, are there any aspects on this you want to pull out, Robert, before I hand over to you for the half year financials? I, no, I, I think it delivers. Look, we delivered revenue growth through an acquisition strategy and some organic growth but also that revenue growth has filtered through and delivered into both EBITDA and profit. So it's profitable revenue growth. I think that is the key thing that we need to identify to everyone. Uh, am I now in control? Yeah, I'll, I'll <laughs> so, yeah, so I'll go through the um, key financial highlights, take us through a little bit of the P&L and the balance sheet and bring out some key areas and the, and the cash flow in latter slides. Um, I want to give a healthy um, warning on this, that we're not comparing like with like. Obviously, this half year includes the acquisition for the full first six months. Um, so you'll see that drive through our revenues and our EBITDA. And last year, we only had the acquisition for one month of the year. So, so just to reiterate, this is not comparing like with like, but this is, is showing the, the growth of the business from half, half year last year to half year this year. So our revenues have, have increased quite significantly around 44% to 26.6 million. Um, and what, what I want to pull out from that is that the, the weight of our professional or legal services revenues within that. So of the 26.6 million, 20.7 million of it come from the legal professional services. So the weight of legal services in our business is significantly growing with circa 80% in this half year. And, and the comparison last year, was circa 70%. So with that, you'll get a drive through to EBITDA and to profit as well. Um, our EBITDA is 6.8 million. Again, the flow through from the delivery of incremental revenue. What you'll see in the business is that our margin is 25.6% down on last year. Because of the weight of legal services, the legal services margin is less than both Convex and, it, and Lionfish when it delivers into the business. So in this half year, we've got a slight, slight skew to legal services, but what we'll see in the second half is that will balance up as both Convex and Lionfish have more impact on the full year results. Profit before tax, again, 4.4 million, again, driving up. One of the things is slightly lower than last year, A, because of the revenue mix um, and the profit mix, but also certain of our our interest charges have gone up as we've increased our, our draw on debt slightly. And also our property portfolio has grown as well. So there's a significant interest part to that when we show in our results. The revenue per fee owner, we always drive at this. So slightly behind last year. Again, that's down to the mix of our business in legal services. At the end of last year, 50% of our businesses was dispute resolution. Um, at this half year, it's more around 30%. So you see a slightly backing off on that. We've seen that across the business. But what I would say is for a business or a legal services business that's not in the top 100, i.e. on total revenue, we still fit within the top 20 of legal services businesses on revenue per fee owner. Cash conversion, obviously a very difficult environment out there at the moment and seems to be continuing. 
we got 90% cash conversion. So we always, if you've listened to any other of our presentations, we're sort of cash obsessed as well. So we drive that cash side of the business and we've been very successful in the first half of this year. Our lockup has ticked up from 102 days to 120. That's down to the skew of the business. I highlighted that um, dispute resolution is now only 30% of our business. The non-contentious side of our business has now grown. You will see a slight tick up in the in the lockup of the business, but I'm expecting towards the end of the year that this will rebalance itself as our dispute resolution side of our business um, performs better over the second half. Gains on litigation, Nikki talked about us doing litigation realizations. So 1.7 million in the first half year, only 100,000 of that relates to Lionfish. These are the um, sell down of some of the settlements on RBGLS and Nikki can bring out a little bit of a strategy around that a bit later as we go through. Um, I talk a little bit about net debt. Our net debt's gone up to 17.3 million. I've got a breakdown of how that, that is driven later on in our cash slide. But fu fundamentally, as part of the, this half year, we've invested in litigation investments. We fin finally paid off the final payment to the convex, sorry, the memory crystal deal. We've paid dividends and we've paid down our, our term loan as well. But you'll see that later on. Profit before tax, 3.4 million, slightly up on last year. Our earnings per share, again, in, incremental to where we were last, last year, showing that the acquisition we made as we, as, as we set out would be earnings enhancing, adjusted cash flow, 3.1 million. And again, um, in the RNS, we, we've stated that we'll be paying a two pence per share dividend, an interim dividend as we did last year. Um, a little bit more detail on the income statement. Um, I think I highlighted it before. So, you know, of our total revenues, 26.6 million, um, you know, 78, 80% of that is from our legal services. Skewed from that last half year where it was circa 70%. Um, within that, or we always talk about this, we do an element of contingent work within, within our business, which is not recognized. So these are, the, these are um, work that we've done on our contingent cases. In the first six months, we did a, an incremental 1.2 million of contingent work, which is not recognized in this. So the cost side of this is in the business. Year to date, we've invested 12.5 million in our contingent work. And what you will see, hopefully, as we go forward and we're successful, all the costs are already built into the PL. And if they're successful, they, this will drive through whatever comes into the business will be profit to the bottom line. We talked a little bit about the gains on litigation and the fact that, that the 1.7 million this year was predominantly from RBGLS. We did 1.5 last year. Again, 1 million of that was a sell down in RBGLS as well. So if you look on a year, year by year comparison, our cost base is higher. Effectively, the business is almost doubled. If I look at the average staff to the end of 2021, we were 121 people. To the end of June 22, we're circa 216 people. So you will see a natural increase in the staff costs. Nikki, we talk a little bit. I think one of the questions was around the inflationary pressure on staff. We have delivered an inflation pay rise into the business, but because the way we manage the business um, and the resourcing of the business, that's within what we budgeted as a full year by the fact that, that we, we, we haven't recruited quite as much staff as we wanted to recruit or projected to recruit um, with the level of business that we're doing. So we've managed that inflation increase within our personnel costs that won't impact on the full cost of personnel over the year. Um, so just to pull out that as part of it. Um, the other expenses, yes, they've moved forward. Our business has doubled. So we've got, in effect, a doubling increment on, on our other expenses. But what we're seeing, the key drivers within that are cost base. Look, in any professional services business, your biggest cost is always your staff. Coming after that is rent, rent and rates. And then following from that, you have insurance, IT. So we've seen incremental increases in IT and insurance. What we're seeing within the insurance market, PI costs, if you're in this sector, just seem to be going up and up. So we're trying to manage that as best we can. So of that difference or growth between last year and this year, roughly around 500K of the increment of that is down to our insurance cost. So our EBITDA 25.6, again, I explained a little bit earlier that 
of shift of the business and the weight of legal services has driven that down over this first half. And what we'll see is more contribution for the likes of Convex and Lionfish Neck um, in the second half that are higher margin businesses. So that will drive us to, to our projected 30, 30% plus EBITDA margin for the full year. Just on the finance expenses, yes, they've gone up. Our interest charges have gone up as we've driven more debt and interest and actually debt is more expensive. Effectively 200K of the difference is down to our, our loan interest. And the other part of the finance expense is that because of IFRS 16, then a large chunk of financing cost goes below the line for our rent and rates. So that's a roughly around 100, 150K. So, so that was just a snapshot of, and a little bit more detail on that. Summary balance sheet. When I look at the balance sheet, maybe I've been looking at it for too long. I focus on one item and, and one item is our litigation investments. If you've heard us present before, we try to be as conservative as we can on this. And when I say conservative, we, we, we try to keep this at cash or lower than cash. So if you see on the balance sheet, I'm carrying 15.7 million in litigation investment. To date, we've invested 16.4 million of cash. Um, so our carrying value is less than the cash that we've invested. As part of IFRS 9, and we account under IFRS 9 and fair value, we try to do it on a conservative basis. Then there is a release of cost of sales when we sell, and there is a fair value uplift for, for the sales in order to bring those investments in line. But as you see, as I said, and I you know, repeat, you know, 15.7 million is our carrying value on the balance sheet. We've invested to date 16.4 million. The other area quickly on this, and I can pick up other things if, if you want me to in the questions, the other stark areas, trade and other payables. So they were significantly higher last year. The reason for that, we were still carrying 5.6 million of the deferred payout for the memory crystal deal. So that's all been paid off in these last 12 months from the end of June last year to, to where we sit at the moment. And you'll see partially of that as we, as we move through. So trade debtors and WIP, key areas of the business, and that's significantly different to the previous years. Our lockup has ticked up. I've highlighted in our key financials, the lockup has ticked up because of the skew slightly to the non-contentious business. You know, it's moving from, say 49% last year, you see in these numbers, to, to more of 70% in this first half of this year. But I expect that to come back and I expect the lockup to be driven down as the, as the skew of the business um, delivers. Our net debt is 17.3 million, up on where we were at the year end. We've got cash in the business of 4.8. We've paid down the acquisition loan that was 10 million to 8 million, and with 14 million of the 50 million RCF drone, but you'll see in the next slide of how, how we've invested that over the period, and it's been quite a busy period. I wanted to just reiterate the prior year adjustment from the year end. I got accused of avoiding this and just brushing over this lightly in some of the presentations I did. Um, what happened last year is that we had a reclassification of some of those assets on our litigation assets. Those ones that had an insurance wrapper that were backed by a AAA insurance company fell out of the classification of, of revenue. So what we had to do is reclassify them and show the re income that we received not as revenue, but as um, a liability, even though they're backed by a third party insurance company. And this is just to tie into to the, the interpretation of IFRS 9. So I just wanted to reiterate what was done at the year, year end and the impact that it had. So we don't avoid or I get accused of avoiding any any issues with on, with on this. I think I want to bring you finally to the cash flow, the six months. The core of our business, as I said before, the legal professional services and convex is cash generative. So over the six months, we've generated 6.8 million of EBITDA. We've had some improvement in our networking capital, but the investment side of our business has been quite busy as you will see. So the deferred payment in the second half of this year, which now clears the deferred payment to Memory Crystal, was 2.2 million. We've made litigation investments of 4 million this year. Included in that 4 million, 1.5 million is the investment we made in the um, co-investment vehicle that we set up last year. Then in order that we capture 90% of the returns. We've drawn down 4 million on the loan, 
in order to, to, to manage the part of the business. We've made loan repayments of 1 million and, and obviously lease payments. And eventually we paid the dividend, the, the final interim dividend from last year of 2.8 million. So effectively what you see is we end up the same cash position. We've had quite a busy first half of investing. Next year, I'm oh, sorry, the next half year, we, we don't have quite the same course. We don't have another considered deferred payment. Um, we will still make some loan repayments and the litigation investments will be less than we've done in the first half of this year. So I see us being more cash generative and hence the net debt position improving as we go through the next six months. Um, the final slide is our alternative performance. Um, we've iterated, I've iterated this. We do drive at debt lockup and debt a days. They've skewed slightly for the first half of this, this year. I believe that they will come back over next year as DR becomes more heavyweight within our business. And we are always focused on cash conversion. And we've had to drive this half year to drive more and more cash into the business, as we all do. If you listen to any of our presentations, you could say that we were slightly cash obsessed with the business, but if we just run it as any other business, that should be cash focused. And that's my part, I'll pass back to Nikki. Hello, thank you very much. So just again to um, reiterate the structure of the group, um, Memory Crystal is our non-contentious and Rosenblatt is our contentious side of the legal services. So front-facing brands, uh, that's what the client sees, but RBG Legal Services is our internal name that's industry um, focused and is our corporate, our corporate name. In terms of um, some of the key metrics here and um, really wanted to bring out on revenue per fee earner. So a revenue per fee earner is dropping off, but that is to be expected. And I know that Robert has touched on some of this because of the mix of business. And we're often asked if it will go back to original levels. I mean, that is a price we're going to pay for being a somewhat safer, more stable business and that we were 80 percent dominated by hmm, that's interesting oh, back. 80% dominated by um, dispute resolution work in the Rosenblatt side of the business two years ago. And that meant we could generate these um, uh, exceptional um, revenue per fee owner, but that's not necessarily sustainable in every economic climate. Um, and therefore, I do think we will always track ahead of our peers, um, but I'm not necessarily expecting us to get back to sort of the, the target I, I would like to get to, which is closer to 500,000. Um, so just looking at our EBITDA percentage and drawing that out, um, a bit more, um, we, as I said at the beginning of, of my presentation, we were at 34% margin for the legal services business in 2018. As the group's diversified and built, we've seen that um, drop slightly. We are still targeting 35% for the group um, in the longer term, and 30% is what we think we'll achieve at the end of, of um, this year. So moving on to um, what the business looks like today, um, I know many of you have access to Progressive's research note, which deals with this in a little bit more detail, especially in terms of what the business used to look like. Um, so um, over a year ago, we were 80% dispute resolution uh, with 20% non-contentious, and now there's a much more even split. Um, there has been a lag in some of the DR instructions in the contentious side of the business. We won quite a few cases in the early part of the year. These were pay-as-you-go cases. Um, some of them may be known to you. Stobart was one of them. And, um, and we have just taken on new cases that are kicking off in the second half of the year. So the pipeline in, in contentious is extremely strong. Um, on the non-contentious side, the uh, real estate team has performed well. And in the corporate department, um, banking and finance um, has also done um, one of its best, uh, is doing one of its best years um, ever, really. Um, so moving on to um, the summary. We're trading under the two brands. The legal services division at the half year is 182 people with uh, 126 VNOs. So, and, and what I just want to touch on here a bit about organic versus acquisitive growth. People talk a lot, and I know Gately's results are out today, talk about organic growth. And that suggests that the same people are doing more work, more work, more work. Ultimately, I think in this business, if you're running an efficient business, um, then you haven't got people sitting there working 50% of the time and next year they work 60% and the following year they work 70% and you haven't got, uh, uh, and, and you don't necessarily find in this industry, and particularly for a public company, that partners with practices move um, in uh, that easily um, between the public sector and the private sector. And I can talk a bit about that more 
under Q&A. And therefore, for us, we very much target um, acquisitive growth in using the capital structure of our paper to give people an alternative to the income producing model that exists in the private sector. So we don't particularly subscribe to the simple organic versus um, acquisitive growth story that many of uh, other industries do. I don't think it necessarily works for, for this sector being a people business. Moving on to convex, um, and uh, I've, many of you have seen this slide before, which just reiterates that it's a sell side only M&A advisory that looks for its clients and looks for its deals and has a sort of ready market of buyers, which we've said is predominantly at the moment US private equity, average fee size 750,000 against the industry norm of above two to 50,000. So that's a very good starting place. Um, it took a hit during COVID, as many of you know, and Mike and his team have done an incredible job of rebuilding this pipeline into um, a much broader cross-section, um, less reliant on leisure and, um, uh, and travel and retail as it was before. Um, and we've got 24, um, 29 active deals, sorry, um, 24 um, are, in, uh, uh, are in the sort of sweet spot that we operate in of 10 to 50 million. Uh, a couple are in are in the very high stakes and and, uh, and and a couple in the other sector. So we had a very good first half of the year. Are we seeing a slowdown in deals? Um, we're not seeing a slowdown in terms of getting deals and signing up pipelines and finding buyers, but we are seeing that timetables are being extended. Um, and therefore, you know, there there is you know there has there is some degree of uncertainty around when those will fall. Moving on to litigation finance and just reminding you that we have two types of litigation finance. Under the legal services umbrella, we can invest in our own client matters by doing work for free or by investing advanced um, disbursement funding into their own cases. Uh, we have a couple of elephantine cases, but as we've said earlier, we have currently, I think, 13 isn't it, active cases acquiring five CFAs when we did the memory crystal deal. Um, in Lionfish, which we launched in 2020, we were able to fund other people's litigation where they're using other law firms. And Lionfish cannot fund RBG legal services, so it only funds third party um, litigation funding. If we look um, at, um, and we've said before that we don't currently give much commentary around the um, big cases that we hold on our books with RBGLS. Um, because this gives too much information sometimes to, uh, to our um, uh, defendant. Um, but we can obviously say we've got, as I say, yes, was 13 mitigation investments. So an awful lot still to play for in that side of the, of the business. And all I would say is that the cases, um, certainly the two big ones, have been impacted by the COVID delay on court. So we've probably added a couple of years in terms of the, uh, the outcome of those cases. So Lionfish today has a li um, 11 live cases, um, one um, settlement today, it's sort of one win to date. Um, and as I say, we are expecting to see um, settlements and results start to flow into the second half of this year and the first half of next year. We did do the alternative investment arrangement earlier this year. We have made one investment into this um, uh, structure already. Um, it has gone smoothly and remains a really good um, way in which we will make money at the back end. But it is a long stop play this because obviously it repays the, the investment arrangement first and we um, take our money off the back end of the arrangement. So what's the outlook for 2022? I think that um, no one is going to sit here in my role and be bullish today about the um, circumstances that we face. Um, I very much hope that um, uh, Liz Truss's gamble with debt and financing the energy crisis pays off. If Pan Muir's note, and I know other analysts agree with this, um, is true, then the recession should be shallower and inflation should not be as high. Um, but um, whenever there is distress, law firms tend to do well. Um, the question will be whether the other divisions continue to perform well. We are optimistic that they will, and that's our, our current position on that. Um, so. Um, all that really remains for us not to be confident about is when we will be able to deliver the M&A strategy. Um, because as I say, we have to marry up um, many different factors. And currently it is harder. And I know one of the questions that we asked because it was on the pre-submitted is, is it harder with the share price? And it is harder to, to, to do that, to get shareholder support for dilution at these levels is very difficult.
Um, but on the rest of the business, um, it, it, I'm very positive about it at the moment. Thank you very much. And I'd be delighted to take your questions. That's fantastic. Thank you, indeed. Nicola Robert, thank you for the presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, do please continue to submit your questions using the Q&A tab just situated on the right hand corner of your screen. But just while the team take a few moments to review those questions submitted today, I'd like to remind you that a recording of the presentation, along with a copy of the slides and the published Q&A can be accessed via your Investor Meet Company dashboard. Um, as you can see, we have received a number of questions both pre-submitted and throughout today's event. And if I may just start by reading the first one, it reads as follows. Despite a reassuring trading update, there's been a certain loss of faith in management at RBG. It seems to be driven in large part due to the compensation packages received both by the CEO and CFO and the su subsequent employee share sales. What would you say to investors who may feel management are busy enriching themselves at the expense of shareholders? After all, the share price has only gone sideways since IPO, yet management's compensation has only gone up and gone up significantly. So I um, just wanted uh, to um, to deal with this question in, in a little bit of detail because um, um, I um, I, uh, uh, I I haven't seen much information about this on the blogs, but I know that it has been it has been raised a couple of times. So the first thing is in terms of our remuneration package, our remuneration package has not in fact gone up materially since IPO. It has only gone up in line with inflation, with the exception of this year, where we both took um, we took no pay rise in order to help fund the um, um, the in wage increase that we were expecting to see in the business. I think what has happened is that our one-off exceptional bonus that was paid in 2021 for the delivery of the memory crystal deal and the impact on EPS has been taken as routine compensation and as if that has been added to our package going forward. So our underlying, um, and I've done a little bit of work on that, our underlying um, uh, remuneration is in line with our other um, uh, peer group. And in fact, I'm just looking for the, um, the actual slide that I did. And so um, our base packages, um, if you want to know what our base salaries are, they're around um, half a million for myself and 300,000 for Robert, um, which puts us in the same uh, in the same category um, as some of our peers. And some are actually and a couple of our peers are paid higher than that. In terms of the share price performance, I mean, I am happy to take responsibility for my results. I'm happy to take responsibility for everything that I have control over, but I have no control over our share price. And I think, you know, my quoting our 2018 results um, against our 2022 interims and what, you know, we're, we're expecting our 22 year full year results to be shows that I've delivered on growing the business. Um, and it has doubled in size um, in that time. And the share price does not reflect that. And I don't really see what more we could be doing. I am very proactive. And then I think there was another question about this later on very proactive about managing the shareholder base. So when you talk about subsequent employee share sales, you're positioning that as a negative, as if that's something that should not have happened. And I completely disagree with you because um, what we do when we buy these companies, starting with Rosenblatt and Memory Crystal Convex, um, is that we are commuting people's income that they're already earning for a capital growth. And that capital is a mixture of cash and shares. So there will always come a time when those shares need to cycle out. My job as the CEO is not to ignore that or to pretend it isn't happening as other companies potentially do. It's to address it in a proactive way that should, in my opinion, be more reassuring for you as shareholders, because it's more reassuring for me as a shareholder to know that I'm proactively managing it. When I had an institutional buyer early this year for two million of our stock, I did not have enough um, free floats to satisfy that order for a new institution. I went to those shareholders internally whose shares are not locked. That includes myself, my trust, my pension, Ian Rosenblatt, and the original Rosenblatt shareholders. I had not one share sale um, that was event that was possible out of the unlocked shares. So I then used the um, ability to sell down at up to no more than 20% of the MC holdings and no more than 50% of the convex holdings, which were coming up for unlock anyway this September and said, I will sell out a portion of your position for a relock on the balance of your shares. So for those um, shareholders who took up that option, and it was quite a sell to get me to get some people to do it because of both the price um, and uh, not the value that they wanted to attain. And then the balance of 80% of their equity was then locked for a further year, taking those people's lock-ins through to 2024 and beyond. 
So I actually think that's a proactive, good way of dealing with a potential overhang. Um, And it's something that I've got far more control over than I do over the retail shareholder investor base yourselves, um, who are a very large part of my register. So I actually think that that, that you know we're, we're addressing that in the way that I should do um, as the CEO of that business. Thank you. I think Nicola, you have covered off the second question, which really did say, did the employee share sales result an additional new institutional investor? If not, what's the progress on attracting institutional investors to the RPG stories? I think we've covered that one. Actually, there, I, will just, sure. I will just add one point to that, which is the institutional shareholder base has risen by 5% as a result of the work we did earlier in the year. And on my roadshows this week at interims, which are not often, to be honest, well attended by institutions, we have a reassuring show of hands for new investors that I'm seeing this week and next week. So the, the, the outlook, considering the economic climate and the backdrop of what's happening in the market, I think is good. Fantastic. Thank you. Next one here um, is regarding M&A. Considering the RBG share price is now trading at depressed level relative to its intrinsic value, does this limit RBG's ability to carry out M&A? I know you did touch on that throughout the presentation, but if there's anything further to add at all. I did. I'd like Robert to add his thoughts because um, uh, he's he's always got lots to say and, and he might have another view on this that I didn't express. Yeah, no, I, I think it's the same point. Uh, look, where we are in the cycle in the market, our share price does suppress us doing M&A activity. Um, And also, if you overarch that on, and we've got a question around the debt ratios, you know, as a listed business, people don't like to see your debt ratio greater possibly than 1.5. You know, if we look at where it's projected, we will be circa around one by the end of the year. So, So those two points in case do suppress what we can do with M&A activity. Despite the other part to it is finding the right deals, finding the right price, which are inherently difficult in a market, um, a legal services market. And Nikki highlighted that we're we're looking to invest in in legal services business. So that has suppressed what we want to do. And and in an ideal world, we would have liked to have done something in the first half of this year, but but the market and the debt position stops us from from actually actively pursuing that so we'll look at other alternative ways to finance that that as part of that really fantastic thank you um again we touched on uh, wage inflation robert you did in the presentation there have been several um, articles in press highlighting wage inflation in the legal sector i know it's been asked before but are you seeing greater attrition in the workforce due to employees being bid away or you're having to increase wages to maintain staff and there's a question that's come through during the event as well talking about consensus forecasts around that pointing to a 20 percent decline in free cash flows is that what you expect just to combine the two please I'll start this answer and then I do want Robert to pick up on the free cash flow point because that doesn't look like right to me, but I don't want to be on the record for that. Um, on, on, we're certainly seeing at certain levels um, that there is attrition, there's a bid away policy. We, I said in the results at the year end that I thought that senior associate, associate levels were under pressure. Um, we, you know, we have seen some of that. We have competed with it. We have maintained our levels. Um, and we've also been brutally honest, very lucky because we were in a process of integration. We had given an assurance that we would not have a front end redundancy restructuring process because we felt confident that the right people and the the people that weren't a good fit for us would naturally fall away. So this kind of helped us at a time when um, there might have been people who were being bid away that we quite happily said that was a good opportunity for us to let them go. So it's worked for us as well, but we're not complacent. I mean, the jury's out as to what happens next year. I personally think if, it, unless inflation is brought under control in some meaningful way, uh, and unless the recession doesn't bite, uh, then I would expect to see a reverse of fortunes uh, in that in that regard. And just to the free cash flow thing, it, it leads to profitability, doesn't it? We've we've managed the inflation re-increases, as I highlighted in the in in, in the presentation, around the total number of staff and the staff costs. So, so we're on budget for where we want to be, and and that's a management. And we have delivered an inflation increase, but also, you know, we're driving the business to be resource efficient. And what you'll see in a number, and we'll pick up some other questions. Look, you know, our utilization, just because we potentially haven't recruited as as we set out at the beginning of the year, our utilization still is seventy five percent based on a target of fifteen hundred hours a year. So. You know, we're, we're not chaining people to the desk so they can have no other life. So 
I believe what, what we've done with the business and what we want to do is have a core set to the business that we won't have to go through these boom and bust pace fit periods that companies will go through. So there will be a recession. We're in a recession. There will be layoffs in this sector. Um, so as Nikki sort of alluded to, it will be readdressed. As a business, we want to be sustainable and we want the people in our business to be comfortable with that we, we've resourced the business appropriately so we don't go through the boom and bust cycle that potentially other law firms will go through. That's great. Thank you, Robin. I think you've covered off that next one uh, as well with no recruitment as many, uh, so we're not recruiting as many staff as forecast will have an impact on the capacity to grow revenues. Um, just in case anything further to add. Yeah, there's a, there is a, something small to add. And we've got, um, we have actually onboarded a very, very large case into dispute resolution for the second half that has a really heavy workload at the lower end. And we have, we are resourcing it potentially overseas with a potential of 20 or 25 um, support staff working on the data processing aspect of the case. So that gives an example, you don't always need to recruit in order to, to maintain your revenue growth. And I suppose it comes back to your original model, Nikki, where you want a core number of employed staff and where the business had demands like this case, then we outsourced it or contracted it. So we didn't boom and bust with our, our fixed staff numbers. So we yeah. resourced the business to deliver what what is demanded but effectively you don't which is the norm sometimes in the legal sector where you recruit permanent staff and then when it falls away you have to let those staff go exactly thank you next question we've got here is under rbg legal services revenue is quoted as 20.7 million legal services and 22.3 million total including rbl ebitda is quoted as 6.8 what is the ebitda split between legal services and rbl and please can you also confirm rbl is not within the litigation finance figures um, just for clarity so the total number for rbgls is 22.3 of that, the professional services, i.e. the build and recorded time is 20.7. The remainder is the litigation sales, and that will drop through to the EBITDA. We don't separate the two, um, and there is a little bit of confusion. So you, what, <laughs> what we show as RBGLS and what is delivered in the, in the RNS, where we do the, the regional breakout, it, you know, litigation revenues all go into one section. So uh, the confusion is in the RNS where legal services sit alone and then litigation gains sit as one pot as well. But just from where we're looking here, the total from RBGLS, which includes the litigation sales, is 22.3. Of that, 1.6 million of it is the litigation sales. And, and when it's broken out in the RNS, it's just broken out differently, basically. That's great. Thank you, Robert. Next one we have here. If I heard you correctly, you caution that revenue per fear is likely to drift lower, yet you hold your target of half a million pounds. What actions are needed to reverse the recent downtrend and then reach your personal target? I, know what I, I don't expect it to drift even lower than it is at. I said it is lower because of the change in the mix of business. I always hold a target. The model should be um, you know, a million revenue per partner um, and half a million um, revenue per fee owner. In, in, is generally your kind of it's an industry standard, and the uh, currently only the sort of top five American firms hit that number. Um, so it remains a personal target. I think re if we add the sort of businesses that I want to add with the margin at play and the quality, um, then we've got more of a chance of of, of getting back to the four 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 twenty five levels. But you know, it's always important to have a target that isn't easy to reach, in my view. That's great. Thank you very much, Nicola. Is there an update on the two elephant, Elephantine cases and are they including the number of ongoing cases quoted? Yeah, they are included in the ongoing cases quoted. They are ongoing. Um, Mercury, um, which um, is uh, potentially, well, is an arbitration, um, uh, was seriously delayed by uh, overseas arbitration panels not sitting during COVID. So that is finally underway in, in properly. Um, uh, Shango, which is the other elephant time, we recently had some success um, and are um, up in the uh, with the appeal court and we're up in the uh, going to the Supreme Court on that case. But again, beyond that, we're giving comments around what we believe to be prospects we don't want to do. But that um, that case definitely has some way to go. Well, both of them have some way to go. We won't see 
results on either of those, I don't expect in 2022, it will be in 2023 or four. Thank you. Um, got another question here just around dividend. Please can you guide on the dividend outlook? Well, we remain committed to um, our targets on dividend. Um, we um, Nothing's really changed in that regard. Um, Robert? I don't know no, no. I, I think your original strategy on the IPO, Nikki, was to distribute 60% of profits um, as our, a dividend target, basically. Yeah. Our staff are a material number of shareholders, so therefore the dividend is important to them as it is to you. Thank you. Can you reiterate the investment strategy and how the business hang together as it appears that there are concerns that the group has become overcomplicated, which has weighed on the share price? Um, sorry, I was reading the question before, so give me a second. <laughs> you skip one. Um, no problem there. Well, yeah. <laughs> sorry. I was busy thinking about the other one. Can you reiterate the investment strategy? Um, yes. Yes, I mean, there is, I mean, it's really hard because we go out to institutional investors and we say, is the business overcomplicated? Is that why, um, you know, you don't invest? And we get different answers. So um, is there a level of complexity? Yeah, possibly. I don't think it's as bad as maybe I thought it was. Is there an impact around the fact that there's confusion around IHT relief for the IHT funds, which we've now clarified? So we have issued... Um, a tax note to the institutions and to our brokers to be able to circulate that confirms that we our shares um, are subject for IHT relief. So we think that will make a material difference. Um, but um, I don't. Um, I do think that what we uh, and what we are certainly looking to do going forward is to we will not necessarily be expanding our litigation finance element of the business because we do think that what that brings is a level of uncertainty, and therefore we're much more wedded. Um, at the moment to the delivery of the platform that gives us the uh, professional services growth, which I think is both more e easily understood, but also we get and therefore get more more value for. Thank you. And just stepping back to that question, um, if your basic salaries only went up by inflation between 2020 and 2021, then the heading in the director's remuneration table in the 2021 director's report is incorrect. It says uh, Nicola's basic salary up from 421 to 797. No mention at all of any bonus rememory crystal. It's not um, wrong. There are many ways to no. present it, but effectively the bonus has been wrapped up into the salary. So going forward, we will separate it out. Um, and, and I'm sure Nikki will be, if her salary had gone up to that amount. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, would be, it would be ridiculous. No, yeah. no question. Would be, that would be ridiculous. Um, no, I'm performance led. I haven't have been paid. And the reason it looks anomalous is I haven't been paid a bonus in the other years, as we know. Um, so that's it just looks anomalous. But um, if there's a better way of presenting it, we might, given the level of questions we're getting, we might well do that in the next report. Thank you. Um, I've got here. You mentioned a delay of up to two years in the large cases due to COVID, etc. Does this mean that you're redeploying the staff working on these cases during the period? Does it look that this is a two-year period uh, will continue as a court's return? Will it shorten? Um, so the two years was the two years of COVID that just things ran very slow. And yes, as you saw from our results, they were redeployed and 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 they were working on pay-as-you-go cases. Um, so that does happen. Um, uh, but they are very um, currently um, we're in a lull on one of the cases and one of the cases is very active. That's quite common. And it's very important also for teams to be mixed around and to work on other cases for, for their own career development. So we don't keep it's, it's quite it's, it's quite a bad form to keep one team on one case for sort of four or five years um, uh, solely. You do get a level of knowledge. So the senior team often doesn't rotate, um, but the but the main team will rotate. That's fantastic. Thank you both. You have covered all the questions we received from investors. Of course, there are further questions that do come through. Uh, the company will be able to review these and we'll publish responses where appropriate to do so on the Investor Meet company platform. Nicola, before redirecting investors to provide you with their feedback, which I know is particularly important to you and the team, please could I ask you just for a few closing comments. Um, yes, um, just want to say thank you very much always to um, the support we get from the retail investor community. It's a shame we can't meet more often in person. It was good to meet many of you at Mellow and very much hope to meet you again, um, if not later this year, certainly next year um, at one of those events. 
That's fantastic. Thank you, Nicola Robert. Thank you for updating investors today. Can I please ask investors not to close the sessions. You now be automatically redirected to provide your feedback in order the management team can better understand your views and expectations. This will only take a few moments to complete and I know it's greatly valued by the company. On behalf of the management team of RBG Holdings PLC, we'd like to thank you for attending today's presentation. That concludes today's session. Thank you and good morning to you all.